Welcome back. Uh, last week we finished succulents in the desert, so this week we are going to look at trees, shrubs, and annuals. We'll touch on annuals, not a whole lot, um, in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, our succulents were our water storers, so that was their mechanism of getting around the lack of water in the desert. This week we are going to look at um, water tolerators and water avoiders, so drought tolerators and drought avoiders. Um, so once again, just reminding you, our limiting factors in the desert for plants, animals, anything that is living in the desert is lack of water and extreme heat. As I said last week, the lack of water is the really big deal for the plants. The extreme heat is still a big deal, but it's not as difficult to deal with for plants as the lack of water is. So most adaptations that you see in desert plants have to do with lack of water. There are a few for extreme heat, but more for lack of water. So once again, reminding you, xerophytes. Xerophyte is the word for drought-adapted plants, and that's what we're talking about, drought-adapted plants, in these last two weeks of this um, module. And basically, they have adaptations that allow them to get through those very dry periods in the summer. So I talked last week about having three options for desert living, and we talked last week particularly about succulents. We will not be talking about succulents this week. Those are the water stores, the ones that are able to actually store water in their bodies and be able to survive the drought that way. This week we are looking at drought tolerance. So they have adaptations to conserve water and withstand drought. So um, mechanisms to keep them from losing water from their bodies, although they don't have the tissue inside themselves to be able to store extra water. They just want to conserve the water that they have. And then we have the drought avoiders. Drought avoiders are usually annuals. Annuals, most of the wildflowers are annuals. They, once the rains come, they germinate quickly, they grow, and they reproduce quickly, and then they die. They basically don't live through the hottest part of the summer. So annuals are one time, one year only plants. Whereas perennials are ones that keep coming back year after year. Um, so. Looking at some common tree and shrub adaptations, and when you guys go out on your hike this week, looking for trees, shrubs, grasses, annuals, wildflowers, things like that out in the desert, I want you to not only take pictures of them, I want you to stand for a minute and kind of study them. Look at their leaves. Look at their branch structure, okay? Look at their height. Look at where they're growing, things like that look for some of these common adaptations that these trees and shrubs have adapted because remember this is a structure and function class we want to relate the structure to the function and you'll see many of these repeated in multiple plants within the desert so if you look at leaves in these trees and shrubs you will see that most of them are a light green to a grayish silver color okay which is not being from up north, what we're used to seeing in plants. We are used to seeing dark green leaves where they do most of their photosynthesis through those leaves. Well, in the desert, instead, in these bushes and shrubs, we see light green to grayish silver leaves, and that is to allow them to reflect sunlight, to decrease the heat intake that they are going to take through those leaves. We also have many hairy leaves and hairy stems, which you don't see up north at all. Um, you see very fuzzy leaves and fuzzy stems with hairs on them. Um, those hairs are used to reflect sunlight. Once again, trying to reflect some of that sunlight back so that they don't take in as much heat as they would otherwise. Um, the hairs also provide a barrier against moisture loss. So one of those uh, drought toleration mechanisms is basically those hairs provide a layer of um, still air around those leaves that allows for wind to not pull water out of those leaves. If there's any wind running past those, the hairs basically block that wind from being able to pull water out of those leaves. And then also those hairs protect from predators. Um, hang on a second, I got a itchy trigger finger this morning. Um, so those hairs protect from predators. Um, the hairs are not consumable. They can be very irritating to predators, herbivores, things like that to humans. If you touch these leaves, I'm not recommending that you touch them, I'm just recommending that you stand and look at them 
if you touch them, those hairs can be very irritating to your skin as well. So um, not always a good idea to touch them. Uh, they are what we call deciduous, okay? Succulents, obviously not deciduous. Succulents stay green all year long and maintain all of their spines, etc. A lot of these trees and shrubs are what we call deciduous, meaning that when it dries out, when there's a drought and there's no rain, they drop their leaves, okay? Many of these trees and shrubs are able to photosynthesize through their stems, okay? Which is not something you generally see in the north at all in non-desert adapted plants. So they can basically drop their leaves, which then decreases the surface area that they have exposed to the sun, which decreases the surface area that they are going to lose water from. So it allows them to um, survive severe drought and still be able to live and photosynthesize somewhat, at least through their stems. Um, many tree and shrubs in the desert are very quick growing. They can grow new leaves very, very quickly. We're gonna talk about one or two of those where basically a rain comes and within two or three days they have new leaves. Really, really quick growing new leaves to be able to take advantage of that water when it comes. Um, new leaves and flowers following a rain. So they can flower very quickly as well following a rain, able to use that water that's present and then able to pollinate and reproduce while that water is present. And then we have the annuals, which are the drought avoiders. They have very short life cycles, as I said, allows them to avoid the drought altogether in that they don't live during those drought periods. They just die off, but they have produced their seeds, they pollinated, all that kind of stuff, and they've done what they need to do. They've reproduced, got their seeds into the next generation, and then it, for them, doesn't matter if they die. Okay, so another thing we've been talking about, and we talked about last week when we were talking about succulents, was nurse plants. Okay, last week we were talking about the cactuses that require these nurse plants, and this week we're going to talk about the nurse plants themselves. So basically nurse plants serve as cacti nurseries. So cacti, when they are seedlings, are not able to survive in the full-on desert environment. They can't survive in direct sunlight and the extreme temps of the desert. And so nurse plants basically serve as protective mechanisms for these cacti as they are growing up and maturing. And they grow basically under the canopy of these nurse plants, which allows them to stay out of the direct sun and the extreme temperatures. Temperatures are lowered underneath those nurse plants and allows those cacti to be able to establish themselves and become mature and eventually be able to withstand those um, extreme temperatures and direct sunlight. Uh, so we have several species of cacti are actually very specific about the type of nurse plant that they grow under. They become dependent on a specific species of nurse plant and some symbiotic relationships exist between those cacti and the nurse plants and I'm actually going to talk about that in week 13. In week 12 we're going to start into our new module. We're going to look at symbioses, symbiotic relationships where more than one organism is dependent on another. We're going to look at predator-prey relationships where those two, predator, the predator and the prey, are tied together and unable to get away from each other. And week 12, we'll just be kind of going over those types of relationships as an overview. And then in week 13, we are going to focus on desert symbiotic relationships. So since we're just coming out of the desert, I thought it would be a good idea to then look at relationships where different desert organisms are completely dependent on each other. So we will talk about that more in week 13 in those specific cacti that are dependent on specific nurse species. Um, eventually the cacti mature, they're able to tolerate the desert conditions, and as they get larger, they actually very quickly soak up all the available water and often that nurse plant is at least stunted in growth if not actually killed by the cacti that it has been nursing. So it's sort of almost like a suicide mission for the nurse plants, but um, the cacti are able to survive. So let's talk about some specific 
uh, shrubs and trees and annuals, etc., within the desert. Um, so I've kind of scattered things throughout here, but I'm going to talk about one, some of the most specific ones that you probably will see on your hike this week and some of the most interesting adaptations in these um, plants. So brittle bush is the first one we're going to talk about. It is very common in the Sonoran Desert. It is a drought tolerator. Okay, as I said, it's got those adaptations that allows it to live through the drought. It is a shrub and it actually interestingly produces two kinds of leaves at different times during the year. So during the drought, the leaves are very small. They are silvery colored and hairy. So you can see them right here in this blow up picture. You can see those hairy silver colored leaves, very small leaves. Then when the rains come, these silver leaves go away and they actually grow new leaves that are larger and have much less hair on them when water is available. So that's kind of interesting. Let's go back and look at these silvery leaves. I talked about hairs, I talked about color, all of that kind of stuff. So reflecting the sunlight in that grayish color, we don't see plants really that color up in the north. Um, providing that moisture barrier which reduces the water loss from this plant and um, provides that defense against the predators with the hairy leaves. So if you see a plant that looks like this, probably not a particularly good idea to touch it. Those hairs, as I said, can be very irritating to the skin. Um, some more interesting information about brittle bush is, I called it the sole survivor. I'm a big fan of Survivor on TV, so why not call it the sole survivor? But the reason I talk about being a sole survivor is that brittle bush is able to outcompete all the other, most of the other plants that um, would want to germinate around it and share its area. You can see here in this picture, all of the yellow flowers you see here are brittle bush. Pretty much it's taken over this whole hillside. And the way that it does that is when rains come, there are chemicals within the brittle bush leaves that combine with the rainwater running down the leaves. They produce chemicals that basically inhibit germination of seeds of other plants. So basically when that water gets into the ground and it brings those chemicals with it off of the brittle bush leaves, it basically inhibits the germination of any other seeds that are in the soil around that plant. And so basically you end up with a stand of brittle bush that's almost entirely one species of brittle bush because most other plants are unable to grow around the brittle bush due to those chemical compounds coming from the leaves. Um, that in itself is a cool adaptation because it keeps brittle bush from having to compete with other plants for the precious limited resources of water, nutrients, etc., around the brittle bush plant. So pretty cool. Um, this plant is called desert broom. It is also a drought tolerator and interestingly if you are ever camping in the desert, whatever, you can actually, the reason they call it desert broom is that you can actually cut part of this plant and actually use it for a broom in case you say have a dirty campsite, whatever you need a broom for in the desert, but that's why it's called the desert broom. Um, once again, very, very tiny leaves, okay, that decreases surface area and allows for more water retention within the plant. The less surface area exposed to the sun, the more chance you have, or the less chance you have of water being pulled out of that plant. Um, once again, deciduous, so it loses those, even those tiny little leaves, it loses those tiny leaves during drought periods. Um, the leaves are bitter, okay? So don't go around tasting desert broom. Bitter leaves, that protects them from herbivores that might want to eat them. And this plant also is a common nurse plant for different cacti species. Next, we're gonna talk about desert marigolds. And interestingly, just as I was going through and putting this presentation together and learning about all these shrubs and bushes, I've been walking around campus and paying attention to the plants and going, oh yeah, that, that's probably that, and that's probably that. So now that you know some of this stuff and you start to recognize some of the, these plants, pay attention as you walk around campus and look around for the different plants that you might be able to now identify and recognize around campus. They're, 
beautiful wildflowers going on around campus right now, at least on the Poly campus. I'm sure there are some on the Tempe campus and other campuses as well. So desert marigold is a drought avoider I'm going to talk about. Okay, this is one of those annuals. It is a wildflower and it basically does its what it needs to do within that short period of time that it has rain available and then it dies off very quickly. So we didn't put a lot of wildflowers on your plant identification list because wildflowers are here and then gone again very quickly and so potentially you're going to see a lot of wildflowers out there but we could not predict what wildflowers you might see when you're out on your hike so we didn't put a lot of those on the list because they may be there they may not be there so desert marigold is an annual wildflower it has white very woolly leaves okay so white even white even more than light green so white woolly leaves for, for protection from water loss and herbivores once again you're going to see repeated um, adaptations within these plants um, basically any moderate rain this plant is able to bloom after. So it can bloom really quickly after a moderate rain. It has its pollinators that come in, transfer the pollen, it can create seeds very quickly and then it dies off once the drought comes back. The seeds can remain dormant in the ground for a long time until new rains come and then those seeds are able to open up again. Um, this one is called the desert globe mallow or another name for it is the sore eye poppy. Once again, not something you want to touch or really get too near. Um, it's a short-lived, very short shrub, okay? So you can see it down here in the picture. It's a short shrub. Um, it has triangular gray-colored hairy leaves. So once again, our gray-colored hairy leaves. The hairs on this plant cause eye discomfort. They can actually um, move off the leaves with the wind, and so, um, Basically, it's to prevent herbivores, so the hairs, the herbivores trying to eat it, the hairs get in their eyes and really, really nasty eye discomfort, hence why they call it the sore eye poppy. I was reading a story about um, a researcher who was traveling out to California to do some research. In 1998, there was a really, really wet winter, and so the Sonoran Desert was basically covered. They drove through these big groves of desert globe mallow basically in the desert very very beautiful but they were driving with their windows down and by the time they got to their research site all of their eyes were bright red because of all the hairs blowing around in the wind so definitely don't touch it it's very pretty and this plant actually comes in many colors so mostly peach to orange but you can see red you can see lavender you can see white flowers so lots of different versions of this desert globe mallow but once again very protective of its leaves um, this is a tree so desert ironwood tree it is a common nurse tree and it is symbiotic with some cacti species that actually require desert ironwood as their nurse tree so i've showed you this picture here with the cactus basically coming up through the center of the ironwood tree um, so potentially, eventually, this ironwood tree may be killed off by the cacti that are growing from within it, but um, who knows, maybe not. So this one also is able to grow two different leaves. During dry periods, its leaves are very sparse and they are gray-green, okay, that gray-green color. During wet periods, it will grow darker green leaves that are very, very dense leaves throughout. So basically, it photosynthesizes a lot when there is water and not so much when there is not water as a mechanism for protecting itself from losing water through those leaves. Um, and also from you know the heat of the sun, that's why we get the gray green color. Um, it sheds its leaves before it flowers in May. So we're coming up on May. So in May, you can go out in the desert and potentially see desert ironwood trees flowering, but it drops those um, leaves in May and then it grows new leaves once the summer monsoons come. So sometimes it doesn't have any leaves at all and it has different types of leaves depending on how much water is available. So um, very adaptable kind of flexible plant. As I said this one is a common nursery for many species of cacti. So we'll talk about it more when we get to our symbiotic relationships. Next we're going to talk about the desert hackberry 
Okay, it's also a shrub, has one to two centimeter long thorns at the leaves, so you can actually see those in this picture here. As I said, I have learned very quickly, having moved to the desert, that almost everything here has thorns, whether it's a bush, a tree, a weed, anything has prickles on it, so you don't really want to touch anything with your bare hands. So these thorns on the desert hackberry um, ward off herbivores. It's got fairly good sized fruit here. Herbivores obviously going to want to eat that. And um, those thorns are protecting that plant from being eaten. Um, dull green, thin, leathery leaves. So once again, we've kind of got that leathery surface on there with sort of a coating, a waxy sort of coating on those leaves in order to protect those leaves from having water sucked out of them by the sun. Um, this particular plant, desert hackberry, has a symbiotic relationship with a particular butterfly species that is actually called a hackberry butterfly species. So we're going to look at that pollination relationship. So basically that is the specific butterfly species that pollinates this desert hackberry tree. So we'll talk more about that in week 13 when we're looking at desert symbiotic relationships. Um, next we're going to look at the velvet mesquite and be aware um, particularly you are looking this week at the Virtual Library of Arizona Landscape Plants that was put together by um, our director of our ABS department here, Dr. Chris Martin. Be aware that some of these plants' common names can be different. So I would recommend searching by scientific name. Scientific name is our common language for everything biological. The scientific name doesn't change no matter what plant you're talking about, but a lot of times the common name will change. So if you're looking particularly for velvet mesquite, it might be called something different. And I know in particular when I was going through Dr. Martin's um, website that a lot of the common names were different than what I was looking for. So it made it a little bit more difficult, but um, just use a scientific name and then it's really, really easy to use. So um, the velvet mesquite, okay, mesquite trees, you see these around a lot. I believe in his database he calls it the Arizona mesquite. Um, so let's talk about mesquite trees. Tiny, fuzzy, dull green leaflets. Okay, so really small surface area in the leaf. Once again, dull green and fuzzy with those hairs on it to basically provide that still layer of air around those leaves to keep from losing water through the leaves. Um, mesquite trees are interesting because they have interesting roots. Their roots run both deep and shallow, okay? A lot of desert plants, I was talking last week about cactuses too. Cactuses often have that long tap root that um, allows them to get to some deeper water and then they mostly have shallow roots that go out from the side, allowing them to suck in that water as it comes down really quickly. But mesquite trees have the longest documented tap root of any plant ever documented, up to 160 feet deep. Very, very deep taproot. And that taproot is, is what allows them to dur survive during these extreme droughts. Um, really long taproots basically allows them to go all the way down to the water table under the ground and be able to use that taproot when extreme drought happens and there is not a lot of rains that come down. 90% um, of the mesquite roots are in that first three feet underground, so it does have those shallow roots as well that allow it to capture water from the rains when it comes down. But that tap root is, is really an exception to the rule as far as plants go. And I was telling my husband, we actually planted a mesquite tree in our front yard when we moved here two years ago, and I was telling him that according to Dr. Martin's website, we actually don't need to water that tree anymore. It, can do just fine on its own without ever watering. So um, here's the flower that grows on these mesquite trees, kind of interesting, really, really long floret on those mesquite trees. Um, the Ocotillo is the next one I'm gonna talk about, also a drought avoider, okay? I would call this one a drought avoider. I was kind of going back and forth um, yesterday whether it would be a drought avoider or a drought tolerator. It does a little bit of both but I decided to call it a drought avoider because it pretty much goes dormant during the drought. So ocotillos are interesting because they behave actually very similarly to what we call cam succulents. I talked to you last week about cam photosynthesis. 
the succulents, the cacti we were talking about, using that CAM photosynthesis where you have uh, tem uh, spatial separation or temporal separation, sorry, temporal separation from day to night with your different photosynthetic um, events. And the Akatillo behaves very similarly to how a CAM succulent would behave, although they are not in any way succulent, they don't store water, and they actually use C3 photosynthesis. But they basically, basically with CAM succulents, the, their metabolism slows down during the drought. They're still photosynthesizing, but at a lower level, they basically were um, comparing it to idling a car. And you can start a car faster when it's warm and idled than you can when it has a cold engine. And so that's what basically CAM succulents do, is they basically have this idling CAM photosynthesis going on. And then when the rains come, they can just um, bump it up really quickly to be a lot more photosynthesis. Well, there's a very similar idling metabolism going on in the Akatillo. When it is in drought conditions, it's in this dormant state. It's not the same as what goes on with CAM photosynthesis, but it's very, very similar. And from what I have seen, they haven't exactly been able to figure out how it works. So, Akatillos are also interesting because in their range, where they grow in different elevations, they actually grow on different soils. So, in the top parts of their elevation where they're really high, Akatillos are very sensitive to frost. And so, on those upper elevations where you see Akatillo growing, generally they will be growing on limestone soil. And that is because limestone soil can soak up heat and maintain the heat within that soil. And that helps keep the Akatillo warm on those cold nights when potentially frost comes in the winter time and allows those Akatillos to continue to live and not be damaged by the frost. Whereas at lower altitudes, Akatillos actually prefer granite soils because the granite soils hold more water. So the, basically the granite soils suck up more water and allow that Akatillo to use that water for a longer period of time rather than having it evaporate really, really quickly. So this is what an Akatillo looks like. It has lots and lots of stems coming out of it. They're common around here. I have one in my front yard, so I'm sure that you've probably seen them. It looks beautiful this time of year. You've got these beautiful scarlet red flowers coming out the top of it. Um, and they are very interesting, as I said, because they go dormant. Basically, during the drought, they drop all of their leaves and they look dead. They have very woody stems and they pretty much look as if they have died. And then, as soon as the rains come, within two to three days after the rains come, they pop out all these brand new leaves, which is what's going on with my Akatillo at home right now. You get all, it basically turns bright green, starts photosynthesizing. During the drought, it's able to photosynthesize through its stems. Um, so it is continuing this idling metabolism, photosynthesizing at a low level. And then as soon as the rains come, boom, pops out all these leaves really, really quickly, starts really photosynthesizing. That's when it can produce its flowers and pollinate and produce seeds, etc. cetera. Um, another thing about Akatillos is you have these really long thorns on the Akatillo. Very, they look as if you could touch them, but don't, because they are very, very, very pokey. Um, Akatillos also have very shallow roots, okay? Once again, allowing them to draw that rain up very, very quickly. And they basically can produce leaves very, very quickly. Um, next, we're going to talk about the creosote bush, okay? And these leaves on this creosote bush, you can see it's a, a fairly decent sized bush with yellow flowers on it, very common in the Sonoran Desert. The leaves of this bush are actually coated with a resin, so sort of like a waxy surface sort of deal that coats those leaves and inhibits herbivores, doesn't taste good, okay? And it also prevents water loss, okay? Rounded fruits are covered densely with white hair. So I put this picture in so that you could see that. Here are the fruits of the creosote bush, and it, it looks a little bit like a pussy willow to me. Very hairy fruits, and those hairs basically allow those fruits to be wind-borne. So when the wind comes, it grabs onto those hairs and blows them away from the plant and allows them to reproduce that way. So they don't use animals to move their fruit around. They basically 
move through the wind, wind dispersal and moving those fruit around and getting those seeds to other areas so that they can grow new plants. Now, I have never been in the desert specifically after a fresh rain, but I'm told that creosote has a very specific smell in the desert and it's not, most people don't find a particularly good smell, but it is very typical of what the desert smells like after a fresh rain because the creosote bush puts out these smells. Um, taproot, very shallow taproot, not like the mesquite that's very deep, shallow taproot and other shallow roots that are about 8 to 14 inches deep, so within that top crust, allowing it to soak up that water really quickly. And creosote is a common food for animals in the desert, also a common place for animals to build their burrows under, provides good shade underneath um, for shade structures, protection from the desert sun and desert temperatures underneath the creosote bush. Um, next, we're going to talk about chuparosa. And I didn't know what these plants were that are all over polycampus, but then I, when I was putting this lecture together, I went, oh, it's chuparosa. So now I know what it is. I see these red flower, beautiful red flowers all over campus, and I had been wondering what they were. So chuparosa, you see them a lot of places. They are used for landscape, but you see them in the desert as well. Um, they have dense, soft, hairy branches. Okay, so their branches are even hairy and have small, oval, grayish green, hairy leaves. So once again, lots and lots of adaptations in this plant. Very small surface area for their leaves, grayish green, hairy, all of that stuff protecting from wind sucking the water away, protecting from transpiration sucking the water away. Really, really drought tolerant, so basically very closely guarding the water that is within it. Um, once again, during the drought periods, it becomes deciduous and it sheds those leaves. And this plant can actually reproduce differently depending on water availability. So when water is not available during a drought period, this plant actually clones itself and creates new exact copies of itself to create new plants. Whereas when water is available, it can actually go through sexual reproduction and produce new genetic varieties of itself through sexual reproduction and genetic variability. But it is only able to do that when water is available. So when water is not available, it clones itself. Um, just as a landscaping idea for you, chuparosa are very good for attracting hummingbirds. So if you want to have hummingbirds in your yard, Chuparosa is a great choice to um, plant in your yard. And that is the end of our Desert Trees, Shrubs, and Annuals lecture. And that brings us to the end of this Sonoran Desert Adaptations module. So good job for surviving that. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, enjoy your hike out in the desert again this week. I promise this is the last one for a while at least. Um, and we will next week be going into our symbiotic relationships module. We do need to be aware that there is a field trip for either the Phoenix Zoo or the Phoenix Botanical Gardens, depending on whether you would rather go look at plants or rather go look at animals. Um, that's going to be your activity for, I believe, week 12. So be aware that that's coming up and you will need to get out to one of those institutions and go through the activity that I have set up for you with that. Uh, the other thing we need to start thinking about is our final projects. So the final is coming up in four weeks or so, four or five weeks, and we need to start thinking about those final projects. Read, there's information on the website about the final project. Basically, you have to turn in a paper and a PowerPoint on the adaptations of a particular organism that we have not talked about at all this semester. So you need to start thinking about what organism you might be interested in researching for that final project because that is coming up and you need to keep that in mind. So thanks. <laughs>